There are so many ministries here at Shoreline that wouldn't exist without your giving. And one perfect example of that is our Change Your World program. Through the change that's collected in these boxes, we can buy these solar-powered audio Bibles called The Treasure. The Treasure audio Bibles, just from last year's giving at Shoreline, have been to India, have been to Mexico, have been to Guatemala, They've been to Kenya and even Haiti. We are basically on an average monthly, we average anywhere between uh, 180 to 200 families uh, that we provide um, food for, which computes out over a yearly thing, a little over 6,000 individuals, including men, women, and children that we provide food. The, the church provides food through the food pantry. Clothing is a little bit higher in number. A lot of it, the clothing comes through donations. The food exists mostly through the uh, giving of the, uh, the congregation in monetary form and also some in, in, uh, in groceries that come into the donations. Well, generosity that's uh, been displayed in Love Our Central Coast has been phenomenal. It takes a lot of people to pull off these great serve days and opportunities to facilitate serving others. Now we have lots of churches wanting to join together in unity and do projects together, do service together. We've seen some phenomenal relationships built in the community. There's been people that now want to give resources to projects around school. The schools want to invite their principals in and their PTA and the parents and the kids to serve alongside of, of the churches coming out to serve them. So it would not have happened without both financial and people resources and people giving their time. So whether it's time, money, clothes, change, whatever it might be, generosity is really the feel that lets the church turn love into action. I was doing a swim training the other day at the Monterey Sports Center, and I'm doing this training to get ready for the triathlon season. Triathlon is a, a swim, get out of the water, get on your bike, get off the bike, do a run. And in the swim training, I'm trying to improve my times <clears throat> Matt, you know, each lap uh, over hundreds of yards, I want to get faster and faster. And so I'm measuring things that I can control. By that I mean I can't get any younger, and I'm probably not going to get a whole lot, you know. So it's technique, right? Pull and grab, push the water, do this. So I'm measuring so many seconds a lap. And I'm doing that because that's what triathletes do. You're always trying to get better. Now, when I say do, I do a triathlon. My son competes. It's a completely different world. <laughs> Think of diesel truck and Ferrari. <laughs> My one spiritual gift I'm aware of is a high pain tolerance. And it comes in handy at times like that. So I did a triathlon and I'm driving home. And at this particular triathlon years ago, I had the opportunity to talk to a lot of professional triathletes. Because I preach at this one uh, triathlon on Sunday mornings, I get the VIP treatment. So I talk to these professional athletes, and many of them would tell you that the most important thing in their entire world is triathlon and getting better and better and better. I'm on the drive home, and I'm thinking to myself, well, is triathlon the most important thing to me? And the answer is no, it's not. So what is? And I run through my list, and I end up with my faith. Jesus Christ is the most important thing to me in all the world, and he's changed everything in my life. And then I think, well, if you measure everything in triathlon and you want to get faster and faster, can you measure personal growth and maturity in your walk with Jesus? And as a staff, we've been looking at that. We've been looking at how do you measure that? How do you do that? Do you, do you, can you measure uh, which parts of your faith? So... We've looked at measuring fruit of the Spirit. We've looked at the Bible. We've looked at worship and prayer. How do we grow intentionally in those areas? And last week, we looked at humble service. This morning, we're going to talk about joyful generosity. Not just generosity. Joyful generosity. And not just giving of money, but giving of all that the Lord has given to you, all that he has given to you. And why would we talk about that? Why would we want to give with joy. Well, Jesus tells us in the 10th chapter of Matthew, he says, freely you have received, freely give. What he's referring to in that part of Matthew is, 
He is sending the disciples out. He says, I want you to go and heal. I want you to go and drive out demons. I want you to do all this work for the kingdom. And I'm giving you all the equipping that you need to do this. And then he says, freely you have received. This thing's driving me nuts. <laughs> freely you have received. Freely give. Well, the disciples are gone. They've been martyred. They're with Jesus. So who's he talking to now? He's talking to us. In the 20th chapter of John, he says, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And that's us. That's us. So in order to learn how to do this well, in order to take what the Holy Spirit has given us, which is the ability to share the love of Jesus, the ability to bring healing and wholeness to a hurting, troubled world, we've got to have some keys to unlock this. We've got to have some keys. And there are two important keys to understanding joyful generosity. Here's a key. And a key unlocks things. A key. Key number one is who owns your stuff? Who owns your stuff? So here's what I mean by that. We all have stuff, and we have to decide who owns it. Scripture gives us a guide. Scripture says in Psalm 50, for every animal of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird in the mountains, and the insects in the fields are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you. For the world is mine and all that is in it. Then we move to the New Testament in the book of James in chapter 1. And James is the leader of the first church in Jerusalem. And most of that church was comprised of Jews who become Christians. The word had not yet gone out into the Gentile world. And James gives an encouragement. And, and he's encouraging the followers to behave a certain way, to act with others in a certain way. Why? Because you're setting the tone for the kingdom of Jesus Christ, which is new. This is the birth of the history of the church. And so one of the things he shares is this comment. He says, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the, heavenly, from the Father of heavenly lights who does not change in the, like shifting shadows. So from these verses, we, le we learn the importance of key number one. I'm going to ask you a series of questions, and I heard a pastor ask his congregation these questions, and it really resonated with my wife and I. Question number one, raise your hand if you chose the place you were born. No hands. Okay. Raise your hand if you chose your parents. Anyone? Raise your hand if you chose your personality. Raise your hand if you chose your gifts. Raise your hand if you chose your talents. Not that you can't grow your talents and your abilities. Raise your hand if you chose fast twitch muscles versus slow twitch muscles. Some of you are going, what's a twitch muscle? <laughs> Look it up. Google will tell you. But it has to do with the athletic endeavors you will excel in or not. Um, how many of you chose? I chose to have rhythm. I chose to have musicality and be able to carry a tune. And we can go on and on and on of the list of things that were given to you. And even more things in life itself. How many of you chose your kindergarten? How many of you chose this, that, and the list, list goes on? The reality is, most of what we have in the big picture was given to us. It was provided to us. And now down to our life today, the things in my home, the fact that I can go to work and earn a living, the fact that my body works, I, and there's food to eat and there's water to drink, I can see all of that as God's provision and blessing in my life. And I can tell you why this is so important. We have to believe this to be joyful as we give. Imagine this, if you don't buy any of that, if you say, I don't buy any of that, nope. I earned this. It's mine. I worked hard. Don't tell me it's not. I put in 12 hours a day. I paid the price. I suffered and I toiled and, and I worked, 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 and it's all mine. Okay, fine. Then you're not going to get the other part. But you know what you're going to do? When you decide what to do with what's, what you have, what you decide what to do with your stuff, your money, your talents, your abilities, the things you own, your cars, when you decide, you're going to consult your brain. Your brain, which is full of you. And your thoughts, you don't want to be in this one for five minutes. I'm not kidding. 
You're going to consult your own thoughts, your own desires, your own resistances, your own likes, your own dislikes, your own resentments, your own preferences, and it can shift day to day. That's what you're going to do with your stuff. Now, if you see it as God's stuff, everything that you have, including your health, the, the things in your home, your time, and your money, if you see it all as God's stuff, who you consult then? You consult him. Father, what would you have me do with what you've given me? What would you have me share? How would you have me share it? Key number one, we have to know that. Key number two, what's the heart got to do with generosity? What does the heart have to do with generosity? What do we mean when we say the word heart? We hear it all the time. Maybe you've done this. You say, well, it's in my head, but it's not in my heart. I have three things in my heart, only two made it to my head. Here to here, here to here, here to here, here to here. We say it all the time. This is not a brain, but I understand what we're saying. When we're talking about our head, we mean my intellectual processes, my ability to, to rationalize, to be objective, to do all those, all those things out of our intellect. When in our heart, we're talking about our feelings, our emotions, the, the tendencies, the, the, the sensibilities we have, our gut level. And the, the deepest we can ever be involved in anything or invested in anything is when both are fully in. I'm thinking about this. It makes perfect sense. I'm feeling it. I'm in. That's the deepest we can ever be. And did you know it includes the body also? The body. Research shows that generosity is associated with empathy. Did you know the effects of empathy can be measured in a psych lab? That great feeling we get, usually when we give, is directly associated with an increase in a chemical called oxytocin. That's a hormone and a peptide, and it's associated with social bonding. This chemical is. And it facilitates trust and attachment between individuals. It also has a mild antidepressant effect. Think of that. Your father loves you so much, he says, I want you to do something for me. I want you to be generous with what I've given you. And guess what? It's going to feel great. How sweet is that? So you might be asking, though, what would Jesus have to do with empathy, oxytocin, and giving? If empathy is the ability to understand what someone else is going through, to have, a, to have the capacity to kind of see it from their point of view, to sort of get them, what would Jesus have to do with empathy, oxytocin, and giving? The writer of Hebrews gives us a glimpse into that. He says in chapter four, for we do not have a high priest who's unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. He is able to empathize with our weaknesses. He gets us. When we go through the Gospels, what we realize is Jesus lived a life with people like you and me. And he got them. And he says, I know how you're feeling. I know you're tired. I know you're hurting. I know you're weak. I know you failed. And, and I know you're suffering. And I know what you need. I get it. I'm with you day in and day out. And so when he finally went to the cross, he did so as a man who'd come to earth to understand us so that we would know he gets us. He did not come as a God who was remote and distant and detached and gazed from up on high and offered us just a bit of pity and sympathy. That's not what he did. He empathizes with us. He came as a man, fully man, fully God, born in the trenches to, to, to let us know that he understands, and, and it made him the perfect sacrifice. He's the perfect bridge between us and God. So the question then becomes, why is that so important? The answer is, and we have to get this, in all of creation, the endless stars, the beauty that's beyond comprehension, do you know what he values the most? It's you and me. We are his treasure. We are his treasure. Scripture tells us that where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Treasure. What do you usually have in a treasure box? Gifts, jewels. There's nothing in here. 
It's open so I can put my heart in it. What do we have in our treasure box? We are his treasure. We are the most valuable thing in all creation to our heavenly father. The Bible tells us he gave us, he gave us everything. He gave us righteousness and he reconnected us to him. And then he gave us eternal life. And how did this happen? Well, Paul tells us in the book of Romans. For if by the trespasses of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? We have the ultimate example of extravagant generosity. So let's say that you're on board with the two keys. You understand that everything that you have, key number one, comes from him. You get it, all right? It's not my stuff, it's his stuff. And key number two is your heart. He wants my heart above all. In the Old Testament, over time, people gave him all their actions. They gave him their animals. They gave him everything. And he kept saying from the minor prophets on and even before, I want your heart. I know you're giving me the sacrifices, but you're withholding your heart. Key number two is our heart. So say that you're in, you're on board. And then what you do is you get that you're a steward of what he's given you. A steward is someone who cares for something of value and uses it properly, handles it well, and makes its value increase. That's what a steward is, say you get that. What's next? Well, to help us understand more of how this works, we can look at Paul's words in Acts 20. In chapter 20, Paul had traveled to the area of Miletus, not too far from Ephesus. And, and, and scripture says he didn't want to go to Ephesus. He really needed to be on his way to Jerusalem. He didn't want to go to Ephesus and be a distraction. Why is that? Because he was never going to return. This is it. So he asked the leaders of Ephesus to meet him in Miletus, and he says these tearful, sad goodbyes. He knows his destiny. And they're heartbroken. They're never going to see him again. So he tells them some things in Acts 20 that are critical last words. You know, think about it. He wants to say, what, what are the things of most value I could give to you? To, because I'm never going to speak to you again. And then he first shares the gospel. He reminds them again of the truth found only in Jesus. But then he finishes with these words. In everything I did, I showed you, showed you, not just told you. I showed you that by this kind of hard work, he had worked hard. We must help the weak. Remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than receive. I'm a receiver. I like to get stuff. I just like receiving. I just do, and I wrestle with giving. But here he says it's more blessed, and so... I do have opportunities in my life to taste that blessing and more and more. I want to grow in that. So in Paul's context, he tells us these are the most powerful things I could say to you before I leave. And then we learn more about the condition of us. How should we give? We know the where and the when do we grow in joyful generosity. Then we move to Corinthians. And Paul says each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give. Not reluctantly, under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Well, that's a nice snappy saying on a calendar or a postcard. But let's look at this. Decide in your heart. Decide in your heart. He's saying, feel it. Feel the leading. Feel the power. Feel the joy. Feel the direction. Let yourself feel this. Decide in your heart to give, and not reluctantly. Not under compulsion. And I add not with guilt. And if you're feeling like, well, every time I give, it's either sharing my truck, my stuff, my time, or even money to the church when I give, I just, eh, it's hard. I don't really like doing it, but I guess I'm a bad person if I don't do it. Stop. Just don't give. Don't. Don't do it. Don't. Because your heart's not right. Get your heart right first. Because he says you're going to, it's blessed, he says. It's more blessed. He wants you to sense that blessing. By sharing with your life generously. He wants that for you. And if you're not feeling any of it, back up. Think again. Where am I with this? Pray about this. So if your heart is all in with embracing the gift of grace Jesus has secured for you, 
consult that same heart for how you should be generous with what he's given you. That same heart. If you're all in, consult the heart. He won't let you down. You'll, you'll get the direction you need. You will. And the Bible guides us in the money part of our generosity. We have a figure of 10% from the Old Testament, and we follow that here at Shoreline. My wife and I plan and do give it 10% as best we can, and if we're off, we want to know about it. But we do plan. We believe it's godly guidance, and it does serve as a metric. In other words, you can measure this. You can look at this. But we also feel like that's not the stopping point. It's not the train station. You don't get off the train there. New Testament calls us consistently to give beyond, beyond, and more. And so we believe that. My wife and I believe that. And we tithe and give beyond. And many, if not all of our staff do, and many of you do. And I'm not saying some don't. I just know that ones do, and I know what they're doing. My wife supports two girls in El Salvador through compassion beyond our normal giving. And then we have another opportunity that we're involved in right now. Several years ago, a couple that I met in Honduras uh, doing a great missionary work that Shoreline was part of, the couple said, well, we're coming to the States, and the guy said, I want to come and spend a few days with you. And I said, okay. He's a great guy. He came and stayed at my house, and he says, i got to talk to you about something. And one night we stayed up late, and the man he was traveling with uh, went to bed early, and this was our opportunity. He said, will you consider pastoring us? I said, what? I mean, pastor, I don't even live in Honduras. What are you talking about? And he began to explain to me how missionary couples sent from the states down there have difficulty getting the help they need for their marriages and their families because ascending churches have limitations of what they can do. And then in the cultural change down there, in the cultural shift they live in, people there aren't equipped to pastor them because they're leaders. I said, wow, me? You gotta, there's somebody else. I mean, you, you're sent from a huge church. Ask them. No, God told us to ask you. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> I said, I'd pray about it. <laughs> you know, it's a delay tactic. I'll pray about it. Then maybe he'll forget. <laughs> I prayed about it, and the Lord was so clear after two weeks ago. I want you to do it. I've never done this before. So I did it. I said, all right, let's do it. And we talked, and we now speak almost every Sunday, not every Sunday, because somebody's gone or something, at 5 o'clock for over three years now. But about two and a half years ago, he said, oh, um, Julie and I also believe that you and Heather should come down here and, and meet with married couples and teach them stuff. And I said, what? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Is this Jeff? I mean, what are you talking about? What do you mean? Churches who send missionary couples have church missionary care programs. He goes, no, 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 no. Let me tell you. So I took notes for like eight months. Tell me. I don't know anything. You tell me. I'm not going to go down there and say, here's what you people need who are missionaries from all over America serving in the jungles of Honduras. I know what you need. That seems so arrogant and inappropriate. I said, you tell me. So they did. And I took copious notes, and, and they said, here's what we need, and here's what we don't need. And I wrote all that up in this little manual. And I said, all right, we'll, we'll, we'll come down. Well, we didn't have the money. We, we didn't know how we were going to do it, but it didn't matter because we had the call. <laughs> he said, I want you to do this. Now, you're not a pastor. You're not going to get that kind of call. But you know what? You're going to get a call. If your heart is open and you say, Lord, it's your stuff. What do you want me to do? I can't imagine that any of you would say, it's been six months, it's been six years, he's never said a word. There's opportunities all around you. It's a condition of the heart to be open to it and say, okay, Lord, use me. And tell me how you want me to use your stuff that I'm temporarily a steward of. So we go. We've gone for two years. It's grown every year. We're going again this year, and there's more people, and we'll just figure it out. We'll just figure it out how we're going to do it. But I mean, it took time and it took energy and, and, and it took some experience that I and my wife have. And, and, and so we decided they're not our resources to use. The gifts that he's given me are not mine to hoard. They're for him to use. And if he tells me I want you to go use it, who am I to say no? Who are you to say no? If he speaks into your heart and gives you something to do. Now, the heart is also where the resistance is experienced. I had it happen the other day. It just drives me nuts. 
I go into the uh, car wash over here by Safeway, right? And I'm too cheap to get the whole car done, so I pay to just do the exterior. And I tell myself, I'll clean the rest on my own, which I don't. But I'm going through, because that's what I tell myself. And there's cars behind me and cars in front of me, right? So I'm, I'm getting near the end, and there's a guy out there working furiously to dry the cars off. And I mean, he can't lose any time because it's like, you know, it's going to stop the line. So I, I'm a Christian. I pull out my wallet to tip this hardworking guy. I pull out an entire dollar. I got seven in my wallet, and I pull out an entire dollar. Then I'm convicted, like, that ass, give him two. There's a five sitting next to the two ones. And then I hear the Lord say, Dennis. So I put the two away and I, I give him the five. I didn't give him the seven. I'm still cheap. <laughs> and I'm going, Dennis, you could have given him the seven. You wouldn't miss it. What, what is it with you? And you know, what is it with us? These things still come up. I wish they didn't. So how to be a joyful giver. There's steps we can follow. Number one, pray to God to lead your giving. If you're married, pray with your partner. If not, pray with your friends. Pray with those people you do Christian life with. Pray with your kids. Pray with your relatives. Pray. Pray, pray, pray. Lord, lead me. Next, consider where you stand regarding your stuff and your heart. Be willing to take an honest look at whose stuff is it and the condition of your own heart. And then reflect on your own Journey with Jesus. This is your testimony. Now, why do I say reflect on it? Remember it. Remember it. Because in truth, we are a being that forgets. Peter says in the first chapter of 2 Peter, let me remind you of what you already know and are firmly grounded in. And I can ask all of you who are over 20 years old, tell me 10% of what you learned in high school biology, and you couldn't do it. You could say, well, I remember a part about the frog. We we learned about body, you know. You can't because we are a creature that forgets. If I said in the last 10 years, if you've lived long enough as an adult, say, say you're 40, in the last 10 years, would you agree that 10 events worth, memorable events occurred in your life each year? That's 100 events. If you said, oh, yeah, sure, I'd say, tell me all 100. You give me like four. Oh, shoot, I know there were more. So, so I'm reminding you this morning but remind yourself of your testimony. And what I mean is sometimes I pray with folks and I've prayed with them over the years and they're good, they're not good, good, they're not good, good, they're not good. Something gets uh, uh, settled, something doesn't, something else comes up. And sometimes they'll say, I don't know what's going on, I don't know where God is because look at my horrible situation. I'll say, can we look back for a minute? Because I remember, I've been here a long time. Can we look back and remember that he's walked you through eight other things that you thought there was no way out of? Remember that. I'm not criticizing or judging. I'm saying, give yourself the time to remember that. Next, review your capacity to give. What do you have to offer? If you're a believer, you know you have a gift. The Bible says it. You have talents and abilities. You have stuff. Maybe you say, well, my stuff's all in my car. What does God want you to do with your car? You, you make an income. Should you give? Sure you should. Why not? Where our money is, there is our treasure. Or, and where our heart is. So, so review your capacity to give and then plan your giving. You know what? And also set up ways to track giving and review regularly. There's never been a time in history where it's been easier to track everywhere your money goes. You can track There's every program under the sun, apps on your phone, everything. Do that. And why would you do that? Because it helps you know that what you have is going out and doing great things. That's good for you. It's good for the heart. It's heart Food. And lastly, who does this? You and me and everyone else who's decided to follow Jesus. You see, giving keeps your heart engaged in your personal walk of faith. Giving of everything, and I mean your time and your resources, not just money, all that you have. And next, giving pleases God and is obedient in using what he's given us. And you can expect a deep satisfaction and a sense of purpose. We all want that. We all want to know that our life means something. And remember, you're giving, when you give in church, you're also giving to your own family, to the body of Christ. 
Now, we don't give just here because we want what we do here to go beyond our walls, but you're giving to your own family. If you believe as a believer, you're in the body of Christ. You're a family member. And then joyful generosity will continue to grow in your heart and spread to those in your life. Everybody's watching. Everybody else. And as believers, when we let people know Jesus is our Lord and Savior and the leader of our life, everybody's watching to see, really? I wonder how that works. I want them to see how it works. I don't want to go to bed at night and continue to get mad at myself for giving somebody five bucks instead of seven. I want to be up to speed with his plan for my generosity. So there's keys. The two keys. All of your stuff is really his stuff. And the second key is your heart needs to be all in because he wants your heart more than he wants anything else because you are his treasure. The Lord of the universe, the creator of everything, values you more than anything else that he's created. That's what he wants for you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you that you gave us, Jesus, the most generous act in all of human history because you were desperate to have us reconciled to you and we embrace that and we thank you for that, Father. We love you for that. Help our hearts be yours every day. Help us sweep ourselves aside. Help us go home today and look at our home in a new way and say, that's not my food in there, it's yours. That's not my car, that's yours. Everything I have is yours. And then tell me what you want me to do with it. Thank you that we can enjoy it and be joyfully generous. Touch each, each one of us today, Father, as you know us best in a way that, that moves us and inspires us. And we pray this Thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen.